Good morning. I'm Josh Laney. I'm the director of the Alabama Office of Apprenticeship, and uh, today we are going to do an employer onboarding uh, for our teacher apprenticeship program. Uh, this teacher apprenticeship program was developed uh, at the directive of Governor Ivey to help relieve the workforce shortage in our state for highly qualified uh, teachers, and also as part of my office's initiative to expand forms of all forms of work-based learning, including registered apprenticeship to create new avenues and new vehicles for people to be able to uh, take advantage of the training to get the jobs that we need filled in our state. So we're gonna talk this morning about specifically about registered apprenticeship for teacher pilot. And um, as we go through this, if there are any questions, we will address those at the end. So first of all, let's just start with a real high level recap of a registered apprenticeship program. Uh, every registered apprenticeship program has these five components. If it doesn't have all five of these things, it's not a registered apprenticeship program. The first is employer involvement. In this case, uh, our employers being the local school systems, the LEAs, were very involved in the development of the teacher apprenticeship. Um, they uh, class, uh, Council for Leaders in Alabama Schools and the State Superintendents Association served as representatives of employers for us and the sounding board to help build out the competencies of what it takes to be a teacher. Um, and the second component of a registered apprenticeship is structured on the job learning. Uh, really, this is the secret sauce. This is the big difference between uh, an apprenticeship program and just a traditional education model for any occupation is that very structured, very specific on the job learning. That on the job learning is the responsibility of the employer to oversee. Only an employer and the journey worker can be the ones to decide if a person has met the objectives of the on the job learning. And we'll talk about that in more detail. The third component is related instruction. So along with the on the job learning, identifying what does a person have to be able to do to be proficient in this job is a set of related instruction components. Well, what does a person have to know to be able to do those things? So in this case, the related instruction is being provided by our EPPs, Education Preparation Programs, I think is what EPP stands for. Uh, EPPs in the state and Troy University being the sponsor in this case is also the related instruction provider. The fourth component is rewards for skills gained. So one of the beautiful things about a registered apprenticeship program is as a person gains skills, they make more money. And um, this is one of the things that allows people who couldn't otherwise participate in traditional training programs to be able to afford to participate. Um, many training models work well if you are a young adult straight out of high school, still on your parents' insurance and all that, but what we're looking for is to create avenues that anybody can access so that they can get into this training. Rewards for skills gains is a critical component of that. And then the final credential, uh, final component of registered apprenticeship is a national occupational credential. In this particular uh, credential, um, in this particular apprenticeship, you're getting two credentials. So you get one from my office, which is commonly called a journey worker certificate. Um, a journey worker certificate is a nationally portable credential that's recognized in all 50 states and territories because this is a federally registered program. Uh, it's not the same as a license, however. In this program, you will also get a license, a teacher apprentice license while you're working, and then a regular class B teacher certification when you're done. So those are the five core components of a registered apprenticeship program. In that program, you've got different um, organizations that have different roles and responsibilities. So the first uh, organization is known as the registration agency. That's my office, the Alabama Office of Apprenticeship. We're responsible for oversight, compliance, monitoring, and expansion of registered apprenticeships in the state of Alabama. So under our office then, the sponsor, in this case, Troy University, the sponsor is the one who is running this specific pr apprenticeship program. This one is called a group program, and you can have multiple employers who come together and they get the advantage of having the sponsor deal with my office and do some of the administrative part of this, but multiple employers get to take advantage of the registered apprenticeship because they offer a consistent training. So it's the same training, whether it's at one school system or another, um, they're going to be the ones that are, are um, providing the, the consistency. The sponsor is also going to be providing some of the oversight for the program. The employer, in this case, the LEA, the local school system, is going to be the one who's delivering the on-the-job learning. They're going to be the one, of course, who's paying and training on the job the, um, the apprentice, but they're also the one who is assigning journey workers. And we're going to talk a good bit today about the responsibilities of the employer. Then under the employer, you've got the related technical instruction provider. 
again, in this case, since the university is the sponsor, they are also the related technical instruction provider. So Troy University here is playing two roles. They are the sponsor and the related instruction provider. They're doing what they always do in these programs, and they're providing college credit coursework um, so that it is aligned with the training needs of this apprentice. And then right at the tip of the spear, the very last um, entity in this is the apprentice. So the apprentice is what this is all about. Um, everybody before that is enabling the success of the apprentice so they can go on and be a productive teacher or whatever it is in this case they're training to be. So let's dive a little bit into those roles in that apprenticeship. I kind of touched on this already. The sponsor, Troy University, has some roles and responsibilities. First, to ensure that the employer uh, and the related instruction duties are getting met. You'll see the word as we start going through the uh, standards documents in a few minutes, uh, ensure in several places. And I just want to highlight the difference between uh, sometimes a person has to ensure that a thing is getting done and sometimes they have to do it themselves. So many times where you look through the standards and you see the sponsor must ensure, it means they either do it themselves or they make sure it's getting done on the job. So that's a, a critical point of clarification. Also, the sponsor is maintaining the records. They are ensuring periodic evaluations of the apprentice, and they will also be participating in those evaluations. They are assessing for prior credit. So this would be part of, in this case, the transcript evaluation. When the, an apprentice uh, applicant comes in the door, they look at that transcript and see what can be counted towards the degree, what can be counted um, you know, towards the apprenticeship, and then maybe what cannot. Uh, they also are responsible for making sure that all of the responsibilities related to EEO, that's Equal Employment Opportunity, are covered. We'll talk about those responsibilities. They can handle complaints. So if an apprentice has a complaint about their training or about their journey worker, they, are, they will be instructed to use their typical chain of command, try to handle that directly with their employer. But if that is related to uh, not getting the kind of training on the job they're supposed to or something along those lines, they can bring those complaints to the sponsor the sponsor can try to act as an intermediary, look into, hey, what's going on? What can we do to make sure that this person's getting trained the way they're supposed to? And then, as I mentioned, the sponsor is also responsible for doing the reporting to my office. Then you've got the related instruction provider. Again, in this case, the sponsor and the related instruction provider are both the university, but it's two different sets of responsibilities. Um, they are to provide the related instruction, easy enough, provide the coursework. They've got to make sure that that related instruction is provided, uh, provided safely and that there is safety included in the instruction they're providing. Uh, they've got to keep up with and track and report on that related instruction. Universities do this anyway, they keep up with the transcripts. Um, and then they maintain qualified instructors. Again, this is a, not a new role for the universities. They make sure that their professors are qualified. Then we get to the third leg here, and that's the employer. So what's the employer supposed to be doing? Well, the employer is providing the on-the-job learning. That's the most important thing. Uh, they're making sure that the apprentices are doing what they need to do so that they can be trained um, in, the, in the occupation that they're training in. They are also making sure that the apprentice is being kept safe and free from harassment, and they are um, assigning mentors. Now, mentors and journey workers, you'll see these two terms used interchangeably. In the world of education, you don't typically hear the word journey worker, but in the world of apprenticeship, we, we call those journey workers. It's an interchangeable term. Um, but we, you need to be aware that they'll be used uh, on and off in different in different cases. So they're assigning the mentors. They are also making sure that the journey worker ratio is maintained. So what does that mean? It means that you can't have, in this case, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So that's always apprentice to journey worker. You can only have one apprentice with one journey worker. So um, not really going to be a problem in an education-related program, but if you think to a more traditional apprenticeship, like on a construction site or or in a hospital, you got to make sure that you've got one mentor journey worker supervising one apprentice. They also, of course, pay the wages and keep up to make sure that the uh, apprentice's progressive wage is increasing as they are um, gaining skills. And then they are responsible for the on-the-job learning, uh, tracking and reporting that. So we will um, talk about some of the ways that you can track that, and I'll show you the example of what we use. So, uh, talking about this uh, organizational structure a little bit, you've got all of those different entities. You've got your sponsor, your related instruction provider, and your employer, and all of those are governed by a set of documents. And so just broad strokes, we'll talk about these documents, and then I want to show you very specifically the, the documents that apply to this registered apprenticeship. 
So the first term you need to know is called the standards. The standards is the overarching set of documents that establishes Troy University as an apprenticeship sponsor. Then under that set of standards, you'll have either one or multiple Appendix A's or work processes. So those two terms get used interchangeably, Appendix A, work process. That defines the training of a specific occupation. So right now, Troy University, they currently teach both nurses and now they're adding teachers. So they'll have multiple Appendix A's, one for nurses and one for teachers. If they add uh, additional types of nurses, for example, LPNs and RNs, they'll get additional Appendix A's. If they do additional types of teachers, elementary, high school, then they'll do additional Appendix A's. I point that out because it's important for the next document, the Appendix D or Employer Acceptance Agreement, the employer has to agree to adhere to each different occupation that they want to train. So just because you've signed one employer acceptance agreement for one occupation doesn't mean you've agreed to train all the different occupations that Troy University has. For example, Russell County Schools is not agreeing to train nurses, right? So if they want if the employer wants to do multiple occupations, you sign one unique appendix D or employer acceptance agreement for each occupation. And then last in that list is the appendix B commonly called the 671, and I'm going to show you what that looks like. That's the document the apprentice signs at the very end of this process and says, yep, I've had a chance to review everything. I know what I'm signing on to, and I agree that I'm going to follow um, these, these standards as outlined. So we're going to jump out of this uh, PowerPoint into a specific set of documents for this program, and I will go here to show you those. So I want to highlight some of the specific components of these documents and particularly how they relate to the responsibilities of an employer. So this is the overarching standards document. Remember, I said this is the thing that sets up Troy University as a sponsor of registered apprenticeship programs. And you will see in this document, this was actually signed in uh, January of 23. These are the responsibilities of the sponsor. Um, and I'm going to cover just a few of these that I've got highlighted here. So first, ensure adequate and safe equipment facilities, training and supervision. So remember, I said that that doesn't mean that they have to do everything in there. They have to make sure that everything in there is getting done. So in this case, the university is not necessarily coming out to the to the school system uh, to do an audit of your facilities or to check and make sure that, you know, your your fire extinguishers are up to date. What they're doing is making sure that the apprentices are being trained safely and if they get any complaints about safety from the apprentices, they're going to look into that. Um, but this is not saying that the university has adopted some new responsibility for auditing schools or coming out and checking safety. Um, the second part here is ensure that they're qualified training personnel and adequate supervision on the job. As far as the related instruction goes, the university does that anyway because they're their employees. And for the supervision on the job, we are going to look at the specific qualifications, but the university is saying that, yes, we're going to make sure that the journey workers that are assigned are qualified journey workers. So they're going to look, they're going to ask the employer, hey, who is assigned as the journey worker for this person? And it can't be um, just, for example, a math teacher who is qualified, who is who is supervising a student who wants to be a science teacher. They've got to be qualified for that particular apprentice. Uh, the next two are some record keeping items. Uh, item number five here talks about the responsibility of the sponsor to let my office know if anything changes with the apprenticeship or with the apprentices within 45 days of that change, specifically if you register a new apprentice or cancel them or suspend them. Uh, 45 days is a long time, so we ask to be notified as soon as possible. The reason I point this out for employers, if you, for example, were to terminate an apprentice, you've got to let the sponsor know because if you don't tell them, it may be a while before they find out and then the sponsor can't notify us. So make sure for the employer and the sponsor relationship, you've got good two way communication so that the employer can be uh, the uh, sponsor can be meeting their responsibilities to keep us up to date. And that's really what uh, both of these two are related to is keeping our office up to date. Uh, number seven, arranging for periodic review. I point this out here because this is a joint responsibility. The sponsor has to make sure it's getting done, but they can't do it by themselves. So the sponsor, Troy, is going to work with the employer, local school system, to review and evaluate the role and the pre, uh, progress of the apprentice. So they're going to make sure that the person is 
passing their related instruction like they're supposed to and they're signed up for classes on time but they're also going to be talking to the journey worker and how's it going in the classroom are you seeing anything that that the apprentice needs to be working on those periodic reviews should always also give an opportunity for the apprentice to provide feedback hey how's your schedule looking are you are you having time to study and all of that uh, and we'll look in more detail at those reviews uh, towards the end here also, make available upon request a copy of these standards. So the sponsor has to be able to provide these documents to the employer, to the journey worker, to the apprentice, or to somebody who wants to be any one of those. So that's one of the responsibilities of the sponsor, but I point it out here so that the employer will know where this is where you go and get those documents if you need them. The, the thing that nobody wants is for an employer or an apprentice or a journey worker to agree to do this program without fully understanding what they're committing to. And then number nine, maintaining records for a period of five years. This again will be the responsibility of the sponsor, but is really a joint activity between the sponsor and the employer. So that um, for audit purposes, if we needed to find out, hey, when we come to a compliance visit later on down the line, this apprentice left, when did they leave? Uh, you know, what was the cause of them leaving? Did they complete the program or were they terminated? That's the kind of records that have to be maintained. Also, uh, responsibility of the sponsor is credit for previous experience, and we'll talk about this when we go through the application here in just a minute. But if that apprentice is applying and they've got college credit, which of course they do in this case, that that uh, credit for previous experience has to be evaluated. Employers, you're going to have to work with the sponsor to make sure that the apprentice's application includes everything that the sponsor needs so they can evaluate it. And I'll show you that application. We'll go through the process. I've already talked about the ratio for journey workers, but I just wanted to again highlight that is unique to each app A, which we'll look at in just a second, or each work process. So is the wage schedule. Um, here is the Equal Employment Opportunity Pledge. This says that Troy University will not discriminate against apprenticeship applicants and then goes on to spell out the rest of that federal statement. By joining on to this program, each employer is committing that they will also adhere to this Equal Opportunity Pledge. And I'm going to show you where that document, uh, where that uh, needs to go on your documentation. But it's important to note that every employer is joining on to this. And just a side note here, if an employer doesn't adhere to any part of the standards, let's just say, all right, you for some reason, uh, an employer says, no, we, we won't do this EEO pledge or we can't sign on to that or, you know, whatever it is. Really, the only enforcement authority that the sponsor has is to say, well, if you don't adhere to the stuff that's in the standards, then you can't be part of my program. So this is not creating some new oversight committee or evaluation to be done by the sponsor. Uh, but if the if the employer doesn't follow these standards or doesn't agree to comply with this stuff, even after signing an employer acceptance agreement, really the only thing that the sponsor can do is say, OK, then we're going to part ways and you're no longer part of part of Troy University's apprenticeship program. There is an affirmative action uh, plan or program that has to be developed um, two, year, two years after the registration of the fifth apprentice for Troy. This is something that the sponsor does. It's not a responsibility of the employer. I just point it out because sometimes employers, uh, school systems particularly, when their attorneys or their board goes over these documents and they look at it and they see that, they kind of panic and they think, oh no, this means I've got to start doing an affirmative action plan for my whole school system. This, that's not correct. The university as the sponsor will do one affirmative action plan for this entire apprenticeship program, and it does not mean that uh, every school system has got to go and do one. We work on that with the with the university, and it is um, it's not it, it is not a big burden that uh, everybody has to go and worry about. Um, general complaints here, and I noted uh, earlier that this was originally written when Troy was just doing nursing. Your general complaints will be updated, so we'll put a, another person here. But for right now, your complaints people, you can bring this to the School of Nursing if you needed to, and they would send this. The difference between a general complaint and a discrimination complaint, obviously, if an apprentice has a general complaint, that would be something like, uh, hey, they've got me in the wrong kind of class. Uh, I'm, I'm sitting in a math class, but I'm supposed to be a science teacher. Uh, or, you know, they got me teaching classes on the roof. It's something that's unsafe or whatever. That's a general complaint. The apprentice would need to start that complaint process locally at their employer and then carry it from there to their um, 
to their sponsor if that didn't get resolved. Then if the sponsor needs us, then they can they can bring us in to try to mediate that. Uh, different from that is a complete a complaint about discrimination. The discrimination complaint can come straight to my office. So this is one of the few things that is unique, uh, a unique right of an apprentice that is different than if they were just a regular employee. An apprentice has the right to bring a discrimination complaint straight to my office. And it's logical that they could because if, for example, it was the employer who was doing the discriminating and they didn't feel comfortable uh, taking that complaint to them, or if it was the sponsor who was doing the discriminating, my office can act as that uh, third party to evaluate that. Um, if we do get a complaint about discrimination, we'll handle that according to federal law and, and regular EEO complaint, uh, complaint process, it, which is spelled out on a poster that I'm going to show you uh, later on in this presentation. Um, and then also we've got a general contact for my office. So that's the overall standards uh, for the apprenticeship. And um, from there, now that establishes Troy University as the uh, sponsor for the apprenticeship. From there, we get specific and start talking about this particular occupation. So for this occupation, it is um, secondary teacher. So that's what we have registered with Troy University as the sponsor is secondary teacher. Uh, let's look at some of the specifics of that one. So this again is called the app a sometimes called a work process. You'll see both of those terms there. This defines the training outline for this occupation. A few items of highlight here. One, this is a competency based program and I'll show you those competencies in a minute. Uh, we've talked a bit about the ratios. So this is one apprentice to one journey worker. You can't put two teacher apprentices in the classroom with one mentor and there is a base for the wage progression. So uh, the to join this program, each school system, uh, LEA has to commit that they're going to pay at least 65% of the standard teacher salary to start with and 85% for year two. Of course, they'll move them to 100% once they become a fully licensed teacher. It also defines what it takes for an apprentice to move from year one pay raise uh, pay scale to year two pay scale. This is one of the reasons that it's very important for the apprentices to be given the opportunity to review these documents so they know I don't get a raise just because I show up again. I have to complete exactly these steps. I have to adhere to this document in order to move through the apprenticeship program. There is a note here about a probationary period. I think we've explained that before for employers. The probationary period does not mean that they're probationary employees. This is not related to their employment at all. This is related to them being in the apprenticeship program. Let's say that you've got a current employee and you decide you want to bring them into the program. And after a couple of months, it's just it's clearly not working out. It's it's not working for you. It's not working for them. And you decide as an employer, hey, I want to move them back to uh, whatever role they had before I put them in the apprenticeship. With this probationary period, you can move them back to that and it doesn't count against the sponsor's completion numbers. So it's sort of like a graduation requirement type deal. Um, but that's that's all that's related to. This does not commit the employer to making that person uh, a probationary employee not related to their employment really at all. This is about them being apprenticeship. A couple of highlights for this particular occupation about the uh, minimum qualifications. I think everybody's clear on these at this point, but in order to get into this program, an apprentice has to meet these minimum qualifications. Specifically, it's the education one. Um, they have to have sufficient transferable college credit, placing them within two academic years of completing a bachelor's degree in the approved teacher prep program and they've got to be confirmed uh, eligible to enroll or already enrolled in an approved teacher prep program at the participating university. The only people who can answer these two questions confidently are the university. So the, the university will need to evaluate the transcript and be able to tell you, yes, you're good to go on these things. And so we'll talk about that process in the next step. The age requirements is minimum of 18. Physical requirements is your standard. You know, got to be able to do the job safely. Uh, without putting anybody else at risk. The selection procedures, and I'm going to skip over this whole section of selection procedures because this first part is about selecting employees from the outside. So potential apprentices would be coming off the street. Well, for this program, we're not accepting off the street applications. We are only doing what we call direct entry. So the only people that can get into the teacher apprenticeship program have to be existing employees of the school system. And that was an intentional decision made very early in the development process 
among the superintendents and principals because we're going to be investing so much money into these apprentices to help pay for their related instruction, to pay for their um, their wages. We don't want to take a gamble with that much state and local money on people that we don't know or have any any background relationship with. So for a person who is an individual uh, is a current employee, these are the steps for their application um, and for their selection that will be made uh, abundantly clear in the application process. All right, uh, for the apprentice and the journey worker, very important also in this work process, this is where you find the competencies. So these are the things that the apprentice has to be able to demonstrate that they can do to progress through the program and to, to eventually complete the program. So the competencies come first. These are always written in the form of the apprentice will be able to, and then whatever this statement is. So the apprentice will be able to collaborate with guidance counselors regarding students' career paths. These things are observed by the journey worker. They can also be observed by the, um, the uh, in this case, the principal or the assistant principal, but supervisors of the by the employer. That's the main part here. Only employer uh, can check off on the job learning activities. So there's a long list here. It turns out there are a grand total of 96 of those. Um, so once they are progressing through these, and I'll show you how we track them, but as they progress through these, you see it's done in three stages, field training and demonstrates fundamentals. So this is, I've observed it, and then demonstrates fundamentals is uh, we've done this together, or the, the apprentice has done this under close supervision, and eventually then proficient in task, meaning that they can do this independently without anybody um, independently without anybody supervising. All right, uh, then further down in this work process, we have the course outline. So the course outline was developed in this case by Troy University and spells out these are the classes that the person has to complete. Now, if they already have some of these, remember we said that the sponsor is responsible for evaluating prior credit, that's fine. In fact, we hope they have some of these. There will be a unique uh, application for each person, and each person's uh, course outline will be spelled out differently for them, just like any other transfer student to the university would have a uh, transcript audit. Note here that you'll see like delivery method says, in this case, VAS. So that is uh, defined in this document right here, virtual asynchronous. That was something that the universities added. So again, the apprentice would know what they're committing themselves to. If you see face to face, for example, that means they're going to have to go to the campus of the uh, instruction provider so they can take that class. So we wanted everybody to be clear, both the employer and the apprentice from the outset. This is what you're committing to. So in Troy's example here, you have, of course, a whole bunch of virtual asynchronous classes, which is great because that means it's flexible so that the working adult apprentice will be able to get these things done. I do want to highlight right here that uh, one best practice we recommend for the employers is figure out a way to give that apprentice time to study. So just for example, if you're on a period schedule, uh, they're going to have one planning period, of course, uh, along with their mentor teacher, just like normal, but not just that planning period. If you can carve out a, a separate period for them to be able to get some some studying done during the day, get some coursework done, because as an employer, you are investing in this apprentice and you're committing that you want to have this person, uh, you know, obviously succeed in the apprenticeship program. And uh, if you can give them that additional little bit of time, then what we hear from our peers around the country who are running teacher apprenticeship programs is that really does have a big impact on uh, making sure that they're successful in their coursework which of course means that you'll be successful in completing your apprentice and get a brand new um, well-trained teacher out of this. So that's the app A. I will highlight again, this one is for secondary teachers. You can see here that it covers both uh, in, in this example, secondary social science um, or English language arts or math. So um, for Troy University, you can do any of those three uh, secondary courses for English language arts, social science, or math. These are all high school teacher, right? So it's one work process. You don't have to sign multiple agreements to be able to do those different things. If at some point down the line, uh, Troy adds elementary teacher or something else like that, a different type of teacher entirely, then each employer will need to agree to that training outline because the training outline would be unique. 
So that's the uh, work process. Then we move to the what's called the Appendix D or the Employer Acceptance Agreement. Hey, Hopefully, Josh, yes, sir. Let me chime in on something. Um, I was looking there as you were kind of scrolling through our course sequence and offerings, and I saw some edits and some updates that need to be made. I don't know how okay. they got by me when I looked at them the first time, but uh, I did want to chime in. Some of those courses that are listed as being offered like in a fall semester uh, virtually, those were actually supposed to be summer offerings. So there's a couple of tweaks I'm going to have to make on that. Uh, okay. That part of the document. So I wanted All to right. chime so, in with that before I forgot. All right. Well, that's OK. That, that brings up a perfect point here. If the app A is ever updated, that will be redistributed. So just like this. If uh, Dr. Johnson says, hey, we've got you know a, a class that's moved, it's not taught at this time now or whatever, everybody who is joining on to the apprenticeship program will need to know that. So we'll make sure that uh, that app A gets updated, redistributed to the employers, redistributed from the employers to the apprentices so that everybody is clear about this is the training outline. Great, thank you. All right. Uh, depending on how much that changes, if it's a scheduling thing like uh, we were just talking about there, hey, it's not offered in fall, it's offered in summer, then that doesn't uh, materially change the training that's being provided. Then you don't have to do a new employer acceptance agreement for that. If it is significant and materially changes the training, which we would determine at the time of the changes, then the employer would need to sign a new employer acceptance agreement so that they could say, yeah, we've agreed to this new outline. Got it. All right. So here's the employer acceptance agreement. This is what the local school system, the LEA, would sign as the employer. And it says, hey, I've reviewed everything in the standards. I understand the sponsor's responsibilities and my part of helping to carry those out. I've reviewed what's in the work process, which is the document we just looked at that outlines the, the training for on the job and the training in the classroom. And I've outlined the pay, out, uh, reviewed the pay progression and all of that, and I'm agreeing to it. So. Here's what this document says, and it's a pretty short document. Uh, it's a, the, the foregoing undersigned school system employer uh, subscribes to the provisions of the apprenticeship standards formulated and registered by Troy University. Uh, so all that stuff we just reviewed, the employer's agreeing to. Uh, on the job, the apprentice is guaranteed assignment to a skilled and competent journey worker and is guaranteed that the work assigned to the apprentice will be rotated to ensure the training in all phases work outlined in Appendix A. So what does that mean? If you go back to the Appendix A, for example, there were competencies related to uh, competencies related to essentials, deep understanding of their subject matter, uh, and then also separately uh, learning dimensions. So what we're saying here is the uh, the employer is committing that they're going to make sure that apprentices are getting experience in all these different areas. So you're going to work with your journey worker, your mentor, to make sure that hey, don't just keep having them. Uh, write lesson plans every week. At some point, they've got to actually start delivering those lesson plans or don't just keep having them work with the gifted students. At some point, they need to work with the students with exceptionalities. So um, as you go through that as a responsible employer, that's what you're committing to do here is to make sure that the apprentice is getting uh, trained in the full breadth of the occupation. Uh, also says that the employer agrees to abide by the policies of the AOA, including but not limited to the living wage requirements, which this teacher apprenticeship is well above the living wage requirement. What that means is my office has a policy that no apprentice can make less than $15 an hour after one year of training, uh, but we're we're well above that, so not imply, uh, doesn't matter here. The employer will fill out this information and some employers on this uh, watching this video may have already done this, but just a quick recap. We do need your EIN number. Please help us by providing that um, and then you're assigning a point of contact. The point of contact in your school system is critically important. This does not necessarily, I mean, it could be, but does not necessarily need to be your superintendent. You need somebody to be the lead for this project in your school system. The main point of contact for people who are interested in joining especially as this is a new program we need at the AOA, we need one person that we can call on a school system. Um, we can't be chasing down everybody within the organization and, oh, you need to talk to HR about that. Oh, you need to talk to our secondary uh, curriculum person about that. We need one good point of contact that's the tip of the spear for this. That's who we're looking for right here. Sometimes we get these filled out and it's the, the CEO or the superintendent or whatever. That's not particularly helpful because when we need to get in touch with somebody, we have a difficult time getting in touch with them. And they're not really the one who is answering day to day questions for apprentices or for, uh, you know, documents that the sponsor might need or anything like that. So 
find a good point of contact, I guess is the moral of that story. Um, the number of journey workers, we're just asking you, this is just a, an item that we're required to collect. What's the total number of people and this occupation is for secondary teacher except special ed and career tech. What's the total number of people in your school system who could be serving as journey workers for that? Um, the definition of people that could be a journey worker will be uh, clear uh, in the application process here in just a minute, but ballpark this. Please don't go and do some major research study within your school system to try to find the right answer. As long as you have more journey workers than you have apprentices, which you will, then you're going to be OK. Uh, minimum qualifications, again, are kind of recapped and pointed out that uh, those are defined in the Appendix A. So that's the mainly for this occupation. That's that education requirement that we talked about. And then here's the wage progression. So if you remember in the App A, the work process, it does spell out the percentages. And this is what we call the floors. So any employer who's deciding to join this program is committing that they're going to pay at least 65% of the entry level teacher salary, but there's no dollar amount here. When you go to the Appendix D, this is the employer acceptance agreement. This is the specific dollar amount that this employer is committing to pay. Now, it can't be less in this case than 65% of the state minimum in year one and 85% in year two, but it could be more. This is a particular point that, that we need to emphasize. The employer is going to tell the school, the employer is going to tell the sponsor, this is exactly what I'm paying in step one. This is exactly what I'm paying in step two. That goes into this document. The apprentice needs to know that, of course, up front. The only other people that need to know that is my office, the sponsor, and the apprentice. It is against the law. It is a violation of antitrust law for employers who are participating in the same program to discuss among each other how much they are going to pay, right? So let's just pretend, for example, school system A normally pays, you know, a 5% supplement on top of the state minimum pay scale. Well, then they get into a conversation with school system B who always just pays the minimum and they decide among themselves, hey, you know, so that we're not competing or we're, uh, you know, sometimes they're called anti-poaching agreements, let's all just agree to pay that minimum. Well, that's, called, that's called wage suppression. It is against the law. It is enforced by the Department of Justice and, and the uh, Department of Labor. <clears throat> Excuse me. Do not do that. So do not engage in wage conversations among employers. Sponsor an employer? Yes. Sponsor and office of apprenticeship? Yes. Em employer and apprentice? Yes but not among employers. All right. So that's the wage progression for this particular occupation. If you do the 65%, it's that, the 85%, it's that. If you're going to pay more than that, the employer will spell that out in these in this uh, acceptance agreement. It needs to be signed by, in this case, it needs to be signed by the superintendent. Uh, but that doesn't mean that that has to be the person who is the contact, right? So we're still talking about two different names here. And then you're going to send that back to the sponsor that you're participating with, in this case, Troy University. So once the school system has signed it, it goes to Troy. Troy is going to sign it. Troy is going to get in touch with me and we will add you to the database as a registered apprenticeship participant employer with Troy University's program. All right. So in this workflow, the next step that would happen is, all right, school system has joined. They've signed on with Troy University. Next step is Troy's going to send me this completed document, this this work, this um, employer acceptance agreement, and from there I will respond to it with with a, an email that says, "Hey, congratulations, you've been accepted to this thing." Next steps are let's qualify you for some of this incentive money. So, the, as you know, the legislature has uh, allocated 2.4 million dollars um, for this year's cohort as incentive funds to help offset the costs, offset the cost of the teacher apprenticeship pilot for school systems. So the way we're doing that is each school system can get up to two allocations from that incentive money. And in year one of the apprenticeship program, a qualifying apprentice can earn $40,000 for that school system. So the money goes to the LEA all in one chunk, $40,000. That can be used to pay for the tuition at the university, can be used to pay for part of the wages, it can be used to pay the supplement for the uh, journey worker, Whatever those specific costs are, the, the LEA will get that $40,000 up front to use it. They'll spell out a budget. But what we have to do first is qualify the LEA. 
So just like you have probably in your local school system, there's a process to become a vendor just to get into the, the system so that you can have a check cut to you eventually uh, by your finance office. Well, we have the exact same process. My office uses the Alabama Industrial Development Training Division, that's AIDT, they're our fiscal agent. So we will send you this after you do your employer acceptance agreement. We will send you this. You've got to commit to certain things that pre-qualification, you understand it's not a guarantee of funding. We're just pre-qualifying you. Um, that the final final determination of the individual apprentice's eligibility is not done until you get that apprentice approved by me. There is a stipulation in here that the LEA will provide the journey worker of the first year apprentice $3,500 stipend. It can be out of this money or out of local funds. We don't care, but you got to pay them the stipend. You can pay them that all up front at one time, or you can divvy it out to them over the course of the um, the first year of the apprenticeship up to you. We'll leave that to your discretion, but that's the amount of the stipend that has to be paid if you get these incentive funds. Year two, the incentive funds require a $2,500 stipend. Also, the incentive funds are meant to offset, and I keep emphasizing that word, the investment in a registered apprenticeship program. It is entirely possible and in fact likely that the local school system is going to have to invest some local funds to do this program. There's no implication that this $40,000 payment is going to be enough to completely cover the bills. So you've got to look at, hey, I'm sending my student, my apprentice to Troy. They've got to take this many classes. It's going to cost about this much money for them to take those classes. These are the wages I've committed to. Do a calculation for yourself. It, it's really not that hard to total up how much this program ought to cost you and determine before you sign on, Yes, I can I can afford as a local school system, as an employer, I can afford that extra two or three or five thousand dollars or whatever it is out of local funds to fund this program. Um, some people had the impression that this program was supposed to be free. Well, it's pretty close when we're giving you this much state incentive money, uh, but there is no implication that the program is totally free to local school systems. Um, the employer, the local school system cannot require a work commitment meaning you can't tell the apprentice, hey, if I put you through this program, you have to work here for me for this period of time or else you have to pay me the money back. I know that sometimes happens. Some school systems have different types of scholarship funds they do or different types of grants to potential teachers that they do. That's not permitted under this because these state funds are being given to the school system. So you can't require the apprentice to pay them back to you if they were to leave the program early. Um, the school system commits that the journey worker will participate in training. My office will pro provide a training. Uh, Meredith leads that up. Meredith Smith is on this call, leads that up, and we have a journey worker training. Typically, it's run as two half-day virtual trainings. Um, so we will we will coordinate that for you, and we will get you the information once you've identified journey workers for them to be able to participate in. We do understand that people have school and people have schedules, and if we're offering it during the summer, then Sometimes people are gone and they're on vacation and they're not on contract. So we will make it as flexible as possible for those journey workers to participate in, but they will be required to participate in order to get this uh, stipend. Um, and then you also are committing that you've done a preliminary review of potential apprentices within your school system. And you you think that you can find somebody who will qualify and participate. How many do you think you can want to qualify for one or two? Pretty much everybody's going to check two. And then this gets signed. So once that's all signed, the instructions are included and it'll come back to my office. We'll get you set up and pre-qualified for the funding. All right, so just a re quick recap. We've got the standards that sets up Troy as a sponsor. We've got the work process that defines the specific training outline. We've got the employer acceptance agreement. That's the part that the employer agrees to follow the work process. Now we have gone through the pre-qualification so you can start to access the money as an employer to help offset that. So the next step here is we've got to find some apprentices. We need to take applications from the apprentices. So I have reviewed this in previous meetings, but just a quick review of the application process for apprentices. Um, this is going to be made available as a fillable PDF and it will be available from your sponsor. So Troy will have a copy of this. Once you've got apprentices that are ready to apply, you're going to get this from Troy, give it to the apprentice. And beginning it's uh, you know basic demographic information. All of this is information that needs to be put into our database. Um, pretty straightforward. We don't have to have the social security number in my office, but the State Department does have to have the social security number so that you can apply for the license. So you do put that on there. 
it doesn't necessarily have to go in first. So you could potentially leave that out until the document is complete and then put it in at the end so that as this document moves among the different parties, it's not going around with the social security number on the front of it. But before it gets sent into the State Department of Education, that social security number has to be on that document. This is a question about pre-apprenticeship programs. We don't have any pre-apprenticeship programs for teachers yet, so everybody's going to mark no on that. Very important right here is a disclosure of disability status. I'm going to show you that document here in a few minutes. Every person who is applying for the apprenticeship program has the right to disclose the disability from the very onset. So that's why this is on the first page of the application. Now, just like in any other scenario, if somebody lets you know that they have a disability, what are you supposed to do about it? Well, in this case, this is not the same as a person requesting assistance. This is gathered for statistical purposes so that we will know if the employer and the sponsor are advertising to people with disabilities, and we will eventually be able to tell what percentage of participants in the program are people who identify with disabilities. So this is the same kind of um, demographic information that we're asking for up here. This is not a determining factor of whether somebody gets in or doesn't get into the apprenticeship program, but the only way we would know if a person has a disability is if they are given the opportunity to tell us. So I'll show you that document at the end. It's very important. Once the apprentice has been selected, it would be if the person chooses to fill it out here, they can, they don't have to. But once the apprentice is selected, I strongly recommend for every employer to get at least one of those forms. Looks like this to get that form filled out by every apprentice at least one time. So you've got evidence that everybody had the opportunity to do it. If they ever want to come back and change their status on that, they should be available to them at any point. This document is available and, and there's a link to it on our website. It's also the information about how to find it is on the poster that I'm going to show you. I can't emphasize enough just because they go in here and say, yes, I have a disability. You don't need to go do anything about that. You need to take that document and you need to put it into a separate folder. This is one place where paper might be your best friend. I sometimes recommend to programs, get a folder that is labeled uh, 2020, uh, let's see, what are we going into? 24, 25 school year apprentices. And that is gonna be where you keep every one of these. This document does not get transmitted to my office. It does not get scanned and uploaded to the uh, RAPIDS database system. It only exists in, in a place where the employer and the sponsor that it was handed to can access it. I don't even have a right to say, show me the uh, disability disclosure for a certain person. Keep this separate and under lock and key, but make sure you get at least one of these for every person who is eventually selected as an apprentice. All right, so moving on. So this is part A, the apprentice is filling this part or the applicant is filling this out. Get down into this section here, and this is the details from the State Department of Ed about background clearance. This is copied and pasted from other uh, applications that the State Department of Ed uses, so your school system should be pretty familiar with how this works. Nothing new or different. Same kind of background checks are required here, and the signature of the applicant indicates the information is true, accurate, and complete. All right, so we're still in the section that the, that the applicant would complete. Now they get to Part B, they need to have their education requirements evaluated by the sponsor. So the name of the institution, in this case, Troy University, this will be pre-populated with the uh, information, contact information for Troy University. The date will be filled out by the university of who has done the evaluation, for what subject area, and ultimately we're looking for, back in the standards, is this person within two academic years of completing this program? Is it possible? If, if they're a brand new freshman, the answer is going to be no, they, they haven't taken classes. But if this is a, a, a person who's got the two years under their belt, that's what's being established here uh, by this evaluation done by the sponsor, in this case, who is also the related instruction provider. The findings of the review are marked in this section, two parts. A, the person does have sufficient transferable acceptable college credit hours. That should sound familiar to you because that's the exact language from the work process about the minimum qualifications and does have confirmed eligibility to be enrolled in the approved teacher prep program at this institution. They've got to get a check for yes in A and B in order to continue with this process. If either of those is a no, 
then you go to check in C, they do not have one of those two things. And guidance has been made available to the applicant regarding recommendations to become eligible for future applications. Remember, the entity that is doing Part B here is the university that is um, the, serving as the sponsor. So this would be Troy University. So Troy is going to say, hey, uh, Meredith, you applied. We looked at your transcript. You've still got quite a few uh, foundational classes of you know, English 101 and that kind of thing that you need to take. Here's what we recommend you do so that you get yourself into a position to reapply at some point in the future. That's all we're asking for with this guidance component. But that was a big part of uh, what our employers wanted to see in our original uh, work group. They wanted to make sure that people weren't just told no and sent away without any idea of, well, what do I need to do so that I can get in in the future? All right. So now that is the uh, apprentice has submitted their application to the school, uh, to the university. University has evaluated it. Let's assume that the university marked yes on both of these. Yep, they do have the credit. And yes, they can get into our College of Education or already in the College of Education. Go send it back to the employer. So this is now the name of the local education providing uh, apprenticeship. And that says, Troy, this would be Russell County Schools or Phoenix City Schools or whoever it is. Um, the contact there that is filling this out. Few questions over here. Uh, is the applicant a current employee in good standing in this LEA? The, the requirement is that they be an employee. So again, I want to reiterate, we're not hiring off the street here. So that's got to be a yes for this to proceed. And then we want to know if it's a yes, when did they start? What are they currently doing? Uh, we've had a lot of focus for the development of this apprenticeship program on uh, parapros and teacher's aides. But the question has come up and we think it is uh, acceptable. Well, let's say that you're a local school system and you've got a, a, um, a bookkeeper or a school secretary who has aspirations to be a teacher and they've been going to school in their own to try to become a teacher one day and they want to apply. They could also apply. So this is not restricted only to parapros and teacher's aides, but it is restricted to current employees of the school system. So then a couple of questions here about what are they doing currently? Do they Are they delivering special ed services? Are they delivering Title I services? Um, and then what grade level are they in? If it was a, a bookkeeper or something, you just hit other and spell out what the other thing they were doing. Uh, you'll note the asterisks there on uh, four, five, six, and uh, that's uh, seven and eight. The asterisk is just saying that these are not uh, components of the decision to whether you get into the apprenticeship program or not. These are items that my office is collecting because we want to be able to report to the governor and to the State Department of Education. Where are these apprentices coming from? So the next part here talks about the definition of who can be a journey worker. Remember, the employer has committed that we're going to find a journey worker and we're going to find qualified journey workers. So what are those qualifications? The qualifications for a journey worker are spelled out in the administrative code. This is the same qualifications that it would take for a teacher to supervise interns. So the master's degree requirement, whatever the requirements are to supervise interns, it's the exact same thing here to be a journey worker supervising an apprentice. And then the question number nine, has the LEA identified a teacher with the appropriate qualifications? So you've got uh, Meredith Smith is filling out this application. She has said she wants to be a science teacher. Um, has the school system identified a science teacher with the appropriate qualifications to serve as a journey worker for this person? We don't want to let this get way down the line and then find out, uh oh, we don't have anybody who can do that supervision. And then what is the name and the certificate number of that person? Uh, payment for the application has been made and it's spelled out on the next page is $38 for that application. This is the application. And as a matter of fact, I may update that on this document. This is the application for the teacher licensure. There's not a cost for filling out the apprenticeship application. And then the superintendent of the local education agency or their designee has to sign saying that they uh, recommend this person for consideration as an apprentice. So three part process there starting in A, apprentice is filling out the basic information and submitting that to the uh, State Department for background check or documenting that they have done their background check. Then they turn it over in B to have their education requirements evaluated by the sponsor and the uh, RTI provider to see if they meet the minimum qualifications to get in. If they do, then they turn it over in C to the employer. Hey, employer, I'd like to do this. The employer says, yeah, you work here. Yeah, you've, you're in good standing. We want to invest in you to make you a teacher apprentice, and we're going we're gonna to sign off on that. When all of that is complete, 
this application should be sent back to the sponsoring college or university. So this whole thing gets finished and packaged out. It's going to be sent back to Troy University. As part of that, the $38 application fee has to be paid to the State Department of Ed. Here's, uh, I'm told that you all do this regularly anyway, but here's the instructions for how to pay that for that application fee. The application fee is the responsibility of the employer. Remember, uh, being a part of an apprenticeship program means that the employer is investing in these costs. So this is the first cost associated with it. Uh, the application will be reviewed uh, by the sponsor and submitted through the State Department of Ed. Once the State Department clears it and that person has gotten uh, approved for a teacher apprentice license, then they can be placed into uh, RAPIDS, which is the database that keeps up with apprentices. All of that will get done and then the apprentice is registered. Once they become registered in the database, we move to this form. This is commonly called the 671. This is the document that the apprentice signs and says, hey, I've reviewed all this stuff. I've applied and been found uh, able to get into the program. Now I actually want to commit that I'm joining this program. You'll notice a lot of these boxes look just like the application. That's because this stuff is gonna be filled out by the sponsor and they need this information. They're gonna be able to pull it straight from the application. All of this stuff gets filled out and submitted to my office. We'll take a quick review and make sure everything is filled out as it's supposed to be in there, and then we will sign it. When we sign it, it's going to have either my name or Meredith's or one of my staff will be typed into this blank right here. The reason I'm specifying this, sometimes people download this PDF and they go hand fill it. That is not how this gets done. The sponsor is creating this document inside the registered apprenticeship database and then printing it out. If this document comes to you without our signature auto filled in this box right here, start asking questions, right? It, it hasn't been reviewed, it hasn't been submitted to the database. Once it is reviewed and submitted to the database, pretty straightforward, the apprentice signs it, the college signs or the university uh, sponsor signs it, and the employer signs it, it goes into that apprentice's record and they are now fully registered as an apprentice in the state of Alabama. Again, as part of this application process, they if they haven't already done it, they should definitely be required at that point in the um, in the registration process. They should definitely be required to complete one of these um, agreements for voluntary disability disclosure. And you say, well, how do you require somebody to fill out a voluntary document? It's voluntary to disclose because they have the option to say right here, I don't wish to answer. Right. So completing the document, not necessarily voluntary if you want to participate, but answering yes or no is voluntary. You can just say, I don't want to answer. All right, I know that was a lot of documents. I'm going to flip back over to uh, a real quick recap of the employer next steps. So we're assuming that sponsor is already taken care of. They've got their standards done. The work process is already defined. The employer has looked at it and said, yep, I want to do this. I want to at least have the opportunity to add apprentices. What do I need to do now? Next steps for the employer, advertise for potential apprentices. You got to let people know. You got to tell them how they can fill out the application. The application will be available from Troy. Uh, once you've signed your app D, you'll be able to get that fillable application from them. Uh, you got to assist the candidates in submitting this application. So you've had this little orientation. You've been looking over this document. Uh, but the apprentice is potentially or the candidate is going to potentially need some help and maybe have some questions. Help them fill this thing out and help them get it submitted properly. We don't want partially filled out applications or incorrectly filled out applications to be slowing down that progress of getting people into this program. Uh, there will be an apprentice onboarding, which I've already mentioned. My office will help with. We will coordinate, uh, probably do one big statewide one and record it so that if you've got apprentices that join later, they can also get on. Um, but you at the local level will also need to do a level of onboarding for your apprentices. Who's their main point of contact in the school system? What should they do if they have a question? If, they, if they've got a complaint, how are they supposed to handle it? That onboarding needs to be done for those apprentices. Of course, next steps for the employers, you need to be selecting journey workers and onboarding those journey workers. Again, my office will help you with an onboarding for journey workers that'll be done most likely this summer. And then monitor and review the progress of uh, apprentices throughout the program. And this is not a sign them up, turn them loose and forget about them thing. So I just wanted to reiterate that you've got to help and coordinate with the sponsor, coordinate with Troy University 
hey, I've got an apprentice. They seem to be struggling in class or they seem to be doing okay on the job, but they're not getting this kind of rotation. Make sure that you are coordinating between the employer and the sponsor to uh, check in on that apprentice. A few other quick notes. We talked about this EEO uh, pledge. It was in the standards document. If you are creating material to advertise your apprenticeship program, that EEO pledge has to be on there. School systems, as employers, you're very used to putting all kinds of uh, non-discrimination clauses on there. If you do Perkins stuff for CTE, there's a particular non-discrimination clause. This is a different non-discrimination clause. You can't just use the one that you have on everything else. This is another one. So you, you've got to make sure that this language is on there. The language is directly available in the um, application for the uh, in the standards. It's also available on on this poster. Uh, so we will provide you with an electronic copy of this poster. It's available for download from our website. We can also print you some if you need. I'm sure you can print them, but if you need assistance with getting some printed, this poster contains the EEO pledge. You need to fill this out and it's got to be displayed publicly, uh, meaning it could be in a break room. It could be at the school where the apprentice works. Uh, you can't just put one on the office in the HR manager's office at the downtown if the apprentice is working at the high school and never comes down there. Uh, this needs to be in a place where the apprentice might actually be able to see it and have access to it. Uh, just a quick note again about the apprentice onboarding preparation equals success. The more answers we can give them on the front end while they're applying, while they're joining the program, what is it that they're agreeing to, the less confusion and disappointment we have on the other end. Uh, the gap between expectation and reality is disappointment. So we want to make sure that everybody understands what they're signing on for and uh, do a good job with that apprentice onboarding. Um, one quick note, too, about anti-harassment training. Most school systems are already doing anti-harassment training. In fact, it may be required, but it is a requirement of the apprenticeship if you're not doing it. Everybody has to do anti-harassment training, anybody who's going to be involved in the apprenticeship program. So that's the journey worker, the apprentice, any other supervisors who may be evaluating the apprentice, whether that's the principal or the assistant principal or somebody from, from your central office, got to be trained in anti-harassment. It's not a special, different anti-harassment training. You can use what your school system already does if you've got that. The only requirement is that it's got to be interactive. Uh, handing them a handbook that says uh, uh, harassment is bad in the 12th page of the handbook, that's not training. It's got to communicate that harassment is not going to be tolerated, and it's got to let the people know, you know, this is what a, uh, an example of harassment is, and here's what you would do if you were harassed on the job. Uh, that's a big component of your requirements as an employer. Make sure everybody's got that. We already talked about this pledge and the EEO poster where it is. Um, and again, I'm going to re reiterate these apprentice reviews. Uh, they've got to be conducted on a consistent basis. You do this for students now in your local school system with progress reports and report cards. You don't just wait until graduation to tell them if they made it or not. Use that same mindset here. You've got to be checking in with your apprentices on a regular basis, coordinating with the sponsor and letting them know how things are going on the job while the sponsor is also the related instruction providers letting you know how things are going in the classroom. Sometimes questions about FERPA come up. Uh, can the university tell me the grades of my apprentice? Yes, because in this case, you as the school system are the one paying for those classes and the apprentice has joined an educational program sponsored by you and this university. So yes, that information can be transferred between the two of you. You don't have to get some separate FERPA waiver or anything along those lines. Oh, I skipped a part there. Always also the last bullet, allow the apprentice to provide feedback. You might think it's going great or you might think there's certain responsibilities. You don't know if you don't talk to the apprentice how it's looking to them. So please make sure that you include the apprentice feedback in those things. Don't just have a, a two sided check in between the employer and the sponsor. Uh, just real quickly, I want to highlight uh, again for the responsibilities of the employer. It is your responsibility as an employer to keep up with the on-the-job learning. Um, how are you supposed to do that? Well, my office provides a, um, a license to some software called WorkHands. It's, it's at no cost to you. We will put the entire work process into this document so that you can go through. It'll be an app on the apprentice's phone and it's an app on the journey worker's phone. So the, the apprentice can say, hey, today I worked on this competency and this competency and this competency. 
and they'll submit it. It'll go to their journey worker and the journey worker will say, yeah, you you worked on them, but you still got some work to go. So they're not there. The journey worker is given the opportunity to mark those things off as you know, whether they're proficient or whether they've demonstrated them in the classroom, that kind of thing. All of that is is much more smooth uh, process than it used to be where you had to keep up with all these things in notebooks. Uh, but we will get you set up with that once you've got an apprentice and a journey worker established. So I realized that that was a whole lot of information, but uh, the good thing about this is we're recording it. So if you need to go back and rewind later on, um, Dr. Johnson and Troy will have uh, this um, recording will be made available on their landing page. Right now, that landing page is at the Alabama Office of Apprenticeship, alapprentice.org, and there is a link to the teacher landing page, and we're trying to put all of these documents and all of these recordings up there. So if you didn't catch it the first time or if somebody you need to show it to somebody else in your organization, you'll be able to find a link to these recordings uh, on that site, as well as the documents that we just reviewed. With that, I will take a breath and see if anybody has any questions or uh, Meredith or Dr. Johnson or Rebecca, if there's anything that I skipped over that I need to uh, need to go back and highlight. One thing I wanted to chime in and say from the uh, sponsor side from the EPP. The uh, those original transcripts that we have to review, those are going to be of just such critical importance. Because um, it is going to help us determine can they get through the program in two years? Um, the schedule mm -hmm. we've laid out, you know, since COVID, we have been offering seven of the eight education courses that are required online in the summer. So that that was an easy thing for us to do to continue that and plan it out for them. Um, then their content courses are going to be available online in terms in the fall and the spring. But, you know, our concern um, might be that they might be missing a few general studies uh, just because they are so specific from the state. So when we do that evaluation, all that's going to be very clear to us. Um, if there are any general studies missing that they might need to pick up uh, as they go through taking their courses. And what would you say? How do you? how do you want to receive those um, transcripts? Is that uh, part of their typical application process for getting into the college uh, college of education, or is, do you want to set up a unique process for evaluating those? When would they like apply for admission to Troy, they mm -hmm. would be turning in their transcripts with their application, and they do the uh, transcript evaluation process, because then they put them in the system as an education major, and then whatever courses they've taken that come in naturally will populate so we can just look at their student progress and it will be very clear to us very quickly what might be missing and sometimes it's not a seamless transition sometimes there are courses that should count as a science for whatever reason and we just have to submit an extra piece of paperwork to get them to bump up to where they need to be in, in their progress uh -huh. but that's how that process works okay and I've I've uh, put up on the screen here the landing page uh, for Troy for um, the teacher apprenticeship program, but it also has uh, Dr. Johnson's email and uh, Beck Faulkner's email, uh, so that you can you can contact either of them. And then right here is the link to Troy's uh, teacher prep program application. So all of that detail that um, about filling out that application, Dr. Johnson just mentioned, should be able to be found there. Is that that right? Well, to be honest, I haven't clicked on that link, but I will and make sure. <laughs> OK, well, that uh, that carries you here with a picture of none other than Joseph Johnson right there. Ah, that picture is dated, but I like it a whole lot better <laughs> than the one on the left. <laughs> All right, well, that's uh, that's the page that carries you to, but we can certainly update that, Joe, if we need to. Yep. All right. Um, Tammy or uh, anybody got anybody else got questions? Well, I, I have a few that I typed while you were um, writing. So going back to Dr. Um, Johnson, uh -huh. do they have to be enrolled or enrolling in Troy for us to do a transcript audit? No, I mean, we could do an informal. I mean, it's just when they when they're admitted, it becomes so official. Like I'm going to do one brief tangent. When transfer students come to us, we have transfer advising sessions. 
and trying to build their schedules when their courses are not populated from their transfer credits. It's just laborious and it, it's hard for us to guarantee that we're, you know, we're human. We might miss something if we're just doing it paper and pencil and, and saying, OK, you've got four social sciences and you got these three maths. So it's not absolutely necessary. We can do an informal review ahead of time, but it's going to be a whole lot cleaner when that application is done and they populate the courses as part of that. Right. I My only concern is that, you know, I don't want people to think that they're in and then do a transcript audit and find out that they don't qualify. Yeah, then we, we could definitely do some work on the front end and, and give you an idea. OK. Um, so yeah, that was that still kind of gray to me. I'm trying to work that out as far as the range between <clears throat> having been within two years. I know that's something everybody's probably working on. Is there a GPA requirement? Yes, 2.75. Okay, we like it to be closer to three because we have to report cohort averages to our national accrediting body. And they've done that for the past four years, and we've never been below 3.2 for a cohort average. But I always tell students, you know, don't be the kid we have to tell no because you pulled the GPA average below three. So it <laughs> says 275, but the hidden curriculum, we highly encourage 3.0 or better. All right, and then and the that's next unique to the that's unique to the College of Education. So that's, I mean, to, to this particular College of Education, just to be clear, that's not a requirement of the apprenticeship program, but each university that you're applying to, they're going to have those standardized requirements for getting into their College of Ed. That's why we were general in the work process and said, whatever it takes to get into that College of Education. No, it's live right now. You got All right. it. So a couple of other questions that I had were just in general. Um, so you had mentioned, um, Mr. Laney, of trying to provide study time for mm -hmm. the apprentice. Is this just in year one, or would this also be recommended when they become the teacher of a record? I mean, I think the more study time you can provide them, the more likely they are to be successful. But that's not a requirement. That's just something that we've been hearing as a best practice um, from other states that are trying to do this. That. It, especially the ones that are, you know, just to be brutally honest, there are some that are calling things teacher apprenticeships and it's not. They're just they're just doing what they've always done and labeling it something different. This is an aggressive program uh, really for for your your highest flyers. Um, so, you know, they're working full time and they're going to school full time. If you're on a period schedule, it's it's a lot easier because, you know, it's not quite as big of a chunk out of their day if you give them one period as opposed to if you're on a block schedule and you need to give them an additional whole block uh, to be able to go and study. Um, but whatever you can do as a as a school system, you know your apprentice um, and you know their their capabilities. And by the by year two, you'll be able to see how they're progressing and how they're handling the coursework and how they're handling the load. And that's a decision that you as the employer make. Okay, and then the last two questions is um, I have not seen the standards, so do I get that from each university? Yes, yeah, so the standards are on the landing page, um, so that's the very first okay. link right here. Uh, Troy University Standards of Apprenticeship right. right there. Um, and right. as I noted, you know, we'll we'll update like there's some outdated contact information. We'll be updating that, but anytime we update them, they'll be right there. Um, and if it's anything more than just a change of contact or anything really significant, then we'll we'll um, probably have to go back through and have folks re-sign, but um, that's where you find them. Okay. And for each area study, um, would I go to this landing page to get that as well? Yep. And I know Troy's only doing uh, three right now. That's right. So right here uh, on that landing page, there's the APA, the work process for secondary teacher. And you can click on it and it'll open up that document that I showed you and it does cover these three English language art, social studies and math. All right, thanks. That mm -hmm. was all I had. Meredith, anything else I forgot? I was just thinking I see your table there at the bottom of the screen. I'm assuming that each school system is going to let you know who they want that contact to be. Yeah, I'm is using the contact. Works? I'm using the contact from the employer acceptance agreement. So that's why I was saying don't 
don't just put the superintendent down there. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and all I'm all I'm putting is the email address. Uh, so I'll put, okay. you know, in this case, uh, Russell County School System and Tammy. Got it. All right. Well, I hope that was useful for everybody. Um, I will make the recording available. And this one, since it's specific to Troy, will be added as a link uh, on this Troy landing page. So if anybody needs to go back and watch it in the future, it'll be right there. Right on time, five minutes to spare. So yeah. um, you guys have a great afternoon. Let me know if I can do anything else for you. Thanks. Yeah, Very important. Appreciate, appreciate you. Thanks, right. Thanks Josh.